This webinar is titled AI, Big Data, and the Impact on Insurance. It features Dr. Danny Bauer of the Wisconsin School of Business at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and Elizabeth Kelleher Dwyer, Superintendent of Financial Services with the State of Rhode Island. Originally delivered to a live audience of both on-site attendees and webinar participants, the session originated from the campus of Illinois State University. It's a collaborative effort of the Institute's Griffith Insurance Education Foundation, the Insurance Regulator Education Foundation, and the Katie School of Insurance at Illinois State. In keeping with the respective missions of these organizations, this session is purely instructional in nature and does not support a position on any issues. To, to start, um, I want to remind everyone that in keeping with the Griffith Foundation's mission, and this is going to be purely educational. Um, uh, this is not meant to be partisan or um, meant to uh, provide any opinions, right? This is um, solely for educational purposes. What I would like to talk to you about today is artificial intelligence, big data, and the impact on insurance. And the fact that you have uh, me sitting here has to do with a couple of um, hats that I'm wearing at the Wisconsin School of Business. On the one side, I'm a professor in the risk and insurance department, and I'm the Hickman Larson Chair in Actuarial Science. So I have um, um, quite some background in insurance and actuarial science. On the other hand, I'm also um, one of the architects and the current director of our master's program in business analytics. And within this master's program in business analytics, I teach our core classes on machine learning. Therefore, I have a little bit of background in insurance as well as in machine learning. And uh, Frank, as well as the Griffith Foundation, thought that I would be in a good position to tell you a little bit about um, artificial intelligence and its impact on insurance. In particular, I'm intending to cover at least the following three questions in today, uh, today's presentation. Of course, in a 45 minutes presentation is only so deep we can go, but I hope to provide some overview on what digital transformation and artificial intelligence mean. Why are these developments important to insurance markets? What are the promises? But I also would like to highlight potential changes and perils that go along with this, particularly from the perspective of the audience of this presentation. Why have a presentation on artificial intelligence in this insurance um, educators workshop, uh, in this insurance regulators workshop? Well, one of the reasons is that this is getting more and more face time, right? The, um, the issues of digital transformation and AI and insurance are being highlighted within the industry, as well as within scholarship. Right here, I collected a couple of articles. You can see McKinsey, Ernst & Young, um, Deloitte, and so on, um, that are all referencing the impact that artificial intelligence is having on the future of insurance, right? The um, idea that um, insurance are on the brink of disruption, right? That this digital transformation might have disruptive influences in the insurance industry. And this is also a theme that has um, been taken up in the scholarly literature. What I'm showing you here on the right hand side is a recent article that I wrote um, with my Wisconsin colleagues, um, Ty Leverty, Joan Schmidt, and Justin Sidnor in the Journal of Risk and Insurance, um, which uh, Joan Schmidt edits. And we had um, a symposium, a collection of papers on insure tech, tech digitization and big data, emphasizing this um, role, role big data and um, AI are playing within the insurance industry. In particular, one of the articles within the symposium here on the bottom by Simon Fritsch, Philip Scharner, and Gregor Weiss made the point that enhanced digitization and more engagement in digital transformation actually can lead, has a positive association with um, profit growth and values of insurers. Right? So the point here is that these topics are getting more increasingly important in the insurance industry, right? So developing an understanding is um, an important part of um, sort of thinking through um, modern aspects in insurance. 
But what is artificial intelligence? Well, to answer that question, I like to go back to one of the founding fathers of artificial intelligence, Marvin Minsky. Marvin Minsky is a computer scientist uh, who was a member um, um, of a workshop, the so-called Dartmouth workshop in the 1950s, 60s, that is sometimes considered as the beginning of modern artificial intelligence. Right. So in particular, the members of these workshops, right, um, were the first to sort of like conceive natural language processing and how um, data can be used to do like, you know, cognitive tasks and so on. However, the reason that I like to go to Marvin Minsky is not so much because he was one of the founding, founding father, fathers of artificial intelligence, but more because he made a prediction that certainly has not become true. In 1970, he said that in three to eight, uh, to eight years, we will have a machine with the general intelligence of an average human being. Now, we are recording this via our computer, but um, even to the state, and this was a prediction made in the 1970s, right? Without a human in the driver's seat, most computers, in fact, all computers, right, will not have the um, intelligence of an average human being, right? So I think Marvin Minsky was far too optimistic in his prediction of, of what AI can deliver. And in fact, that theme was taken off, taken up by um, a, a Michael Jordan, not the, not Michael Jordan, another Michael Jordan, who is also a computer scientist, who has written this article, and we don't have to, time to go into the details here, but I'm referencing it here, and, and I, I encourage you to read it. It's, it's, it's a fascinating piece, who make the point that artificial intelligence has not really <laughs> happened yet. The revolution has not really happened yet. He makes various points in his article, again, laced with um, personal experience, and I encourage you to read through it. But the point I want to emphasize is that he, in his article, makes the point, and, uh, which I um, perfectly agree with, is that many people are confused about the meaning of artificial intelligence. That there's sort of like this perception that there's some kind of intelligent thought in computers that competes with humans, sort of as, um, um, as Marvin Minsky pointed out pointed out. And the point I want to make is that we don't have that, right? Artificial intelligence does not mean that computers are competing with humans on intelligent thought. In fact, most of what's labeled artificial intelligence today, and again, this is a quote from uh, Michael Jordan's piece, is actually machine learning. And I think it's helpful here to distinguish between art artificial intelligence, which is broader, and machine learning, which is more specific. But most of the advances we have seen in artificial intelligence are actually advances in machine learning. And machine learning is the mu much more modest task of finding patterns in data and making well-founded predictions. Now, why are we talking about this now? Right. How is this coming up now? Right. You know, like we've had data for a long time and, and we were able to make predictions for a long time. Well, the reason we're talking about this now, and this is sort of what, what's driving digital transformation, is that there's um, a bunch of mutually connected um, reinforcing aspects that are driving the, the, um, these machine learning applications. It's the following three connected aspects. On the one hand, more and more data is generated, right? That has to do with the internets of things with the cell phone, right? Imagine a bonfire 25 years ago where somebody was playing the guitar, right? Mm -hmm. If that happened, conceivably, that only exists in our memories, right? 25 years ago, maybe if there was a bonfire late at night, you know, somewhere on a lakeside, right? There would not be any digital footprint. In today's world, that's fundamentally different, right? If there are people flocking to that bonfire, they all are ca carrying their cell phones, right, with loco location devices, right, uh, with, uh, with locators. So there will be um, a footprint of all these people flocking to the same point and staying there for several hours. Probably somebody's going to take um, um, a picture of the bonfire or might take a video of um, somebody getting getting out the guitar, uploading that on Instagram, right? So everything, vir virtually everything we do in today's world, right, generates data, right? That data is stored 
and can be used, right? So one thing that is changing with digital interactions, with the internet of things, is that there's much more data generated. Not only is that data generated, but we also have a much better infrastructure for storing it. Right? Think about cloud technology, right? So in particular with the internet and you know, being able to get internet you know, virtually anywhere, right? Not only is there more data generated, but it's also at our fingertips, right? We can easily access it via the cloud, right? And um, with the latest technologies, it's scalable and relatively easy to plug with certain tools, right? These tools are developing too. The third connected in, uh, aspect is that we had a massive decrease in computing power. You guys probably heard about Moore's law that says that every two years, computer um, and, and computer po computing power roughly doubles, right? So not only allow, allows us um, allows this increase in computing power us to do um, um, traditional things in much faster, but it also allows us to tap data that historically with old statistical approaches we're not able to tap. In particular, in Gartner's big data definition, um, um, the three V's that characterize big data are volume, a lot of data, much volumes of it, velocity, it's coming in fast, and variety. The data includes video, text, et cetera, right? So where we used to think that data sort of like fits in a spreadsheet, you know, has numbers and cells and, and a lot, now data is much broader, right? Includes images, includes videos and so on, right? So now we have these, these mutual connections, right? We have more and more data. We have the computing power to process this broad data, right? And it's at our fingertips. What does that mean? Well, we can have new machine learning applications that will lead to more apps. Those apps are going to collect data that's going to generate more data, right? So you have this cycle of, you know, apps, data generation, machine learning application that's sort of reinforcing itself. And what we mean by digital transformation is the broad consequence of these mutually connected rapid advances in data availability and technology that really brings all of this to our fingertips. Right? So the reason that we're talking about AI today, or that we're talking about digital transformation today, that is, is that over the last decade, over the last two decades, right, things have really, um, 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 have really increased in speed, and it seems to be um, um, ever increasing, leading to more data, leading to more applications, and leading to uh, um, more data to be mined. Right? And again, right, what these artificial intelligence approaches do is mostly just checking patterns in this data. But what is a prediction model, right? When we say, well, um, really AI is just machine learning and machine learning only relies on making well-founded predictions and picking up on patterns in data, how does that work? What are patterns in data? Well, in order to do that, it's, it's, it's helpful to go to back to the basics, right? If you think about a prediction model, a prediction model connects features, right? Something you know about something to predict a variable of interest. For example, consider you sitting down at Netflix, right? Netflix knows something about your viewing history, knows your age maybe, and knows your payment patterns, knows how long you have been a client, knows what kind of movies you watched last week, what kind of movies you last watched last year. That's all data that characterizes you in this current state. That's your feature X. Based on that X, Netflix is predicting a certain outcome Y, which show or which movie you might be interested in watching next. How does Netflix come up with that recommendation? Well, they just look at all the data of all the people in the past, right, that looked similar to you, and then liked a certain show that you have not yet watched, right? So prediction models pick up on these tendencies and patterns of relationships between features and situations and outcomes in the past, right? So they look at patterns in their data that look similar to your pattern, and on that basis, try to predict something that mimics what you might like. Now, in insurance, this is nothing new at all, right? This is the same way actuaries have priced, priced car insurance, right, um, ranging, ranging um, decades or maybe even half a century back. 
right? If you think about, you know, making rates for car insurance or predicting claims in car insurance, what you do is you look at the driver's profile. How old are they? What's their claim history? What kind of car are they driving? How frequently are they driving? Then you look at these features that, it, that, that characterize that exposure, and you look how many people with similar features got into a car accident using regression approaches, right? These machine learning techniques work in exactly the same fashion. And in fact, you could think about these traditional insurance rate-making approaches, right? These the, the, the traditional um, regression approaches as simple machine learning tools. What has changed is just that we have much more data, much more refined data, much more um, various data, right? We have text, we have images and so on. And given that we have more data, right, and more advanced models, we can, more ref we can make more refined predictions. Nevertheless, the ingredients for machine learning solutions remain the same as in this sort of traditional insurance example, right? What you need is a relevant predictive problem, right? Again, think about Netflix trying to predict what movie or what show you would like to predict next, or the insurance company trying to predict who's going to get into an accident next year. You need past data, right? Netflix is only able to make these predictions by having the history of other viewers with similar features to you. Insurance companies are only able to make rate to 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 get a um, to get a an estimate of the likelihood for you getting into an accident by observing a whole bunch of drivers in the past and knowing who got into an accident. So you need whys, you need outcomes, you need features. And you need predictive models, right? You need some, some way of connecting the Xs, the features, and the outcomes to Ys. And again, traditionally, these were regression models, right? And here we have a very simple, right? You can think about the X on the horizontal and the Y on the vertical, right? And you have a simple regression line sort of getting through. This is sort of like, you know, 20th century machine learning, simple regression approaches. Now what has happened because we have more data and because we have more computing power is that we can write down much more advanced models. What you see on the bottom here is what's referred to as a multi-layered neural network, which is the foundational model of what is called deep learning. You might have heard about deep learning, right? So deep learning is just a more advanced predictive modeling tool where you have not a regression line, but this network of different connections that um, um, bring the features here on the left side to um, the outcomes, the Y variables here on the right hand side, right? But it works much the same way as the simple regression data. So why are prediction models so prevalent? What are their promises? How can they, um, why, why, why do all these companies that I quoted before make such a big deal out of these prediction models transforming insurance? Well, and there's sort of two related areas that I wanna emphasize. On the one hand, um, more advanced models, richer data is able to make some of the predictions that in the insurance realm we've made for a long time more accurate, right? So some predictions are about the future and traditionally in insurance, if you think about rate making, or if you think about claims prediction, um, this is about the future, right? How likely is it that a customer will crash their car, will have a claim, the house will set on fire, that they will cancel their policy? Right? So these um, machine learning approaches allow us potentially to make more refined, more accurate predictions, right? and thereby um, um, change the nature of insurance. However, and especially in insurance, where we used to thinking about those type of prediction problems, there's a second set of prediction problems that we sometimes don't think about. And those are not predictions um, necessarily about the future, but uh, predictions about the present. What does that mean? Well. If you think about um, some operations in insurance where people, say a claims adjuster is sitting, getting claims information, looking over the claims information, and then has to make a decision on, you know, whether to approve the claim, you know, whether to adjust the claim or, you know, like um, 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 make a certain action, right? Essentially what they're doing, thinking about a well-skilled um, trained individual, they're taking input information, right? They're getting the claims reports and so on, 
and they're making certain judgment calls based on the information they receive. Now, for some claims, that might be very intricate, right? Because some claims might be really complex. It might be difficult to sort out who's at fault and who's not at fault. But there's a large fraction of claims where a well-trained individual, right, probably can just look at it and within, like, you know, a couple of minutes says, oh, this is obvious, this is, we should play that claim. Or, hey, this is obvious, we should subrogate that claim. Right? So what, what, what context are we in? We're in a context where we have a long history of individuals making decisions, right? They're making decisions based on claims reports, right? Those are data. Those are feature variables, X. And they're making a certain determination, Y, of what to do. For example, pay the claim, subrogate the claim, or something like that. So that is a predictive model, right? It's, it's less obviously a predictive model, but it's not really about predicting the future. It's more about routing, right? But these machine learning approaches that are able to connect feature variables, right? So again, think about claim reports and so on to certain decisions, right? Pay the claim immediately, right? Are able to automate a good chunk of what has historically been done by individuals, right? So. While we might, while we, in the past, we, we may have needed an army of people, right, that look at these filings and make a certain determination, a good chunk of this, you might now, um, you might now be able to automate. Now, you probably still need humans in a loop because, as, again, there are some claims that are sufficiently complex to where the computer doesn't really know what to do with it, right? But a large fraction of these 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 situations right a computer can probably you know just go over and 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 uh route it in the same way and in fact a lot of what we're seeing in the insurance industry has this characteristic right one thing that big data and artificial intelligence is doing to insurance markets right is this enhancing efficiency right by being able to automate a lot of these processes claim filing underwriting, et cetera, right? You're able to make things way more efficient because you can outsource to a machine a lot of the things that have been traditionally done by humans, right? And in fact, many of the um, insure tech companies, right, of those disruptors in the insurance industry sort of focus on problems like that where you can have automation, right? So um, um, I, I, I have a, a couple of them, their logos here on the bottom, right? But a lot of these um, insurance companies, right, try to automate, uh, to automate claims processing, try to automate underwriting, right? Try to take sort of like, you know, inefficiencies and, um, and long um, process cycles out of the picture. Now, this sounds great. Efficiency is a good thing, but of course, right? And this is um, always the thing. Um, you know, if 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 it's good on the one side, right, there might also be um, issues with us on the other side. And one of the issues that sort of comes to mind here is that if you think about um, the people that have historically done these these uh, have historically done these um, these tasks, right? If a computer is taking over, right? it's unclear whether you need the same number of people doing these tasks before, right? Um, in fact, that has been highlighted by um, this paper by Osborne and Fry, um, the future of employment, how susceptible jobs are to computerization. And what these, uh, um, what these researchers did is they were looking at job characteristics. So they were actually building a machine learning model where they're looking at job characteristics as the features and as the outcomes, whether these jobs are computerizable or not, and they try to predict whether certain job profiles are more likely to be taken over by computers or less likely to be taken over by computers. And what you can see here on the bottom is that some of the careers in insurers, right, insurance underwriters, insurance sales agents, are some of the jobs that these um, authors argue are very likely to be taken over by computers in the future, right? So while, you know, these efficiencies are maybe uh, these, in these gains and efficiencies have some positive aspects, right? Think about expense ratios and insurance, which are, which are, which are rather large, right? And, and if you are able to automate and, 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 and 
uh, speed up these processes, you might be able to think do things faster that might enhance customer experience, right? And you might be able to do things cheaper, right? Which will then lead to a decrease in the expense ratio. But at the same time, right, there is some angst around the question of what um, um, the people that were traditionally working in these areas will do will do in the future. Now, um, that, 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 that there's various aspects here, and one thing, if I had more time, that I would go over is this article by Ajay Argaval um, and his co colleagues, um, what to expect from artificial intelligence. Again, a fascinating read that if you're interested in this area, I recommend to you. And what um, Ajay Argawal and his colleagues point out is that, well, in a world, right, where computers are able to take over certain tasks, the tasks that are not, you know, are not right to be taken over by computers, that are not easily computerizable, right, will increase in value. So as a manager, what you should try to do is direct your employees, is direct your staff, towards um, tasks that are less likely to be taken over by AI solutions, right? And that really the way we should think about this is not as something that, 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 that is endangering careers, but maybe that changes careers towards, um, um, uh, you know, like towards a way in which they can um, benefit from computerization rather than be threatened by it. But prediction problems are ubiquitous in insurance, right? If you think about them, solvency capital and economic forecasting, which is at the heart of sort of like, you know, thinking about, um, think about solvency assessment, um, artificial intelligence has a role, right? Again, these are predictive problems, right? You're thinking about um, the company's current situation and you're thinking about the likelihood of whether they're able to make good on their financial promises, right? Whether they were able to pay their liabilities. Those are fundamentally predictive problems, right? And a bunch of researchers have taken up this analogy and have you have explored the use of artificial intelligence for claims and um, for calculating um, company capital, et cetera. Now, I don't want to go into details here, but I just want to point this out that there's multifaceted um, um, applications of predictive problems in the insurance realm. However, the most traditional one, and I'm going to come back to, to the, the previous slide where we sort of talked about prediction problems and insurance. The most traditional one in insurance clearly is around claims prediction. Right? So in particular, right, two of the processes that in insurance that, you know, like you are probably engaged with too, is to think about, well, companies have to make a decision who to um, provide insurance to, right? Which, how to select risks, how to classify those risks, right? Who pays what premiums? What are the terms and conditions that certain, that, that certain um, people will be offered um, in the insurance contract, right? And that's also, um, to some extent, what, what, is, what is being supervised. And clearly those are predictive problems, right? Thinking back to um, the auto insurance, well, right? What you're doing is you're looking at certain characteristics of features of an individual, and you're trying to determine, you're trying to predict of whether they're more, more or less likely to get into an accident, right? And AI here is that role that these more advanced models, right, unlike traditional regression models, may be able to take more data in, and they might be able to more accurately, uh, more accurately predict the class in which a certain individual should go to and which premium they should pay. Right. So in particular, right, in, in rate filings, right, you can think about more data being used and more advanced models being um, um, being used for 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 predicting claims. And at first sight, that sounds great. That means, you know, if if, if rates are more accurate, if people are um, paying, um, if, if you're more accurately able to predict somebody's claims, right, that seems like a good thing at first sight. However, and this is again. Um, sort of like the, the, the image of er the, the, the story of earlier, right? Um, where there's an upside, there's arguably also a downside. So in particular, machine learning models are not magic. They rely on pa patterns in past data, right? And that's sort of like important to, to, to just, just consider, right? 
artificial intelligence models are not, you know, really intelligent. All they're doing at the current state of the art, right, is looking at patterns and past data and trying to mine these patterns in order to make well-founded predictions. That automatically means that machine learning models can fail, right? In particular, when certain historical patterns are no longer accurate, right, or if certain patterns are reinforced, right, machine learning models can fail. They can be non-transparent, right? These, these black box, very complex models, right, could be and, and can be, you know, very unintuitive, and certain players could take advantage of that black box, um, black uh, of that black box um, character, and you know, um, um, could could in fact can in fact use use them for what is labeled as AI snake oil. Machine learning models can't distinguish from correlation and causation, so in particular, patterns they pick up uh, on may not have a causal effect, right? Some of the patterns might be historical patterns that are there for historical reasons that don't have causal um, um, relationships, and I'm going to go through that in a little more detail. And machine learning models may uncover and rely on patterns that we may not want to reinforce, and especially this latter point is important for the insurance industry, as I will explain. But what are certain examples of AI failures? Well, if, if you if you look at um, um, if you you know if you look at um, sort of the, the literature, there's a variety of examples, right? So um, IBM's Watson was um, that's their our, um, the artificial intelligence engine, engine by IBM was touted as the future of medicine, right? It will be that it will take out doctors and it will be able to diagnose patients. That hasn't happened. As you probably know, self-driving car, realizing self-driving cars, right? maybe think about some tweets by Elon Musk, um, realizing self-driving cars, it's much more difficult than people have anticipated, right? There's a lot of um, challenges there. Um, and there are stories about recruiting tools, ruling out systematically, ruling out women. women. Um, there's also the story of the um, Microsoft AI chatbot but that learns some unbecoming language, right? Eventually, all of these can be traced back to the idea that artificial intelligence is nothing else than trying to look at historical patterns. And if these historical patterns are no longer accurate or get, get reinforced in a certain weird way, right, and machine learning solutions that are um, trying to mimic those patterns won't work anymore. AI snake oil, right? So again, the, the second peril that sort of comes along with machine learning is that this black um, 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 black box character of these models can um, generate some foul play. And the example I like to bring up here is a tweet that has since um, been taken down by um, the insurance startup Lemonade. And what they tweeted um, is that, for example, when a user files a claim, they record a video on their phone and explain what happened. Our AI carefully analyzes these videos for signs of fraud. It picks up on nonverbal cues that traditional insurers can since they don't use a digital claims process. Now, this sounds pretty fantastic, right? So if I record a video on my phone, they pick up on um, nonverbal cues in my face on whether I'm saying the truth or not. However, um, and, you know, there were a, a bunch of, like, um, experts that pointed that, that out very quickly. That is just too good to be true, right? That That, that is unlikely. In fact, um, Arvind Naranyan, who is a, a researcher at Princeton University, um, um, tweeted as an educator who collects examples of AI snake oil to alert students to all the harmful tech that's out there. I thank you for your outstanding service, Lemonade. Right. So what 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 they're trying to get across is that you know a lot of times companies might tell you, oh, our AI can do this, or our AI can do that, where if you have some expertise in that area, you will be quickly able to pick up that, you know, that's not really working. Why is that not working? Well, again, imagine, right, or, or remember that machine learning is nothing else than looking at patterns of data, right, and finding patterns of making real founder predictions. Now, if you imagine somebody 
recording a video, right, um, and reporting a claim. And they will be frazzled after having gotten, in, gotten into an accident, right? And the angle in which people will record a clay, uh, will record that video will be different, right? So it's going to be very, very difficult to have a large enough data set to pick up on nonverbal cues in people's faces as all these different angles in order to figure out who was lying and who wasn't lying. In fact, where do you even get the information? Where do you get the historical data on who was lying and who was not lying? Right. So sort of going back to the foundation, hey, is it likely that they have a rich data set on X and Y variables and mm. that they will be able to figure out what patterns lead to fraudulent behaviors will maybe um, um, make you somewhat, you know, will alert you somewhat to, to the existence of, of AI snake oil. However, the last and, and, and maybe the important um, peril of machine learning models is that artificial intelligence models, machine learning models, may pick up on patterns we may not want to reinforce. One um, voice that has been particularly loud in that context is that of Kathy O'Neill. And you can see on the left-hand side, Kathy O'Neill has authored a book, Weapons of Math Destruction, right, in which she says that um, the usage of these models, these advanced models, and more and more data actually has negative consequences because it can lead to reinforcing problems of, 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 of racial biases and so on, right? If the data is biased or if these algorithms are biased, right, having the algorithms take over decisions that were originally made by humans, having these algorithms in the picture for automating processes can lead to a reinforcement of certain biases. Right. And that's, again, sort of related to this that is um, Amazon tool um, that was used that was using this this AI tool for recruiting that was systemic system uh, systematically biased against women. Right. This is particularly relevant in the insurance industry. Right. And in fact, there was this ProPublica article um, that examined racial discrimination in auto insurance prices and, and, and showed that insurance companies that use more of a digital process and more AI um, actually had sort of like more um, more racial discrimination within their prices. And um, there's this article, and I put the reference down here in, in the Wired magazine, that makes the point that these supposedly fair algorithms can perpetuate discrimination and can actually um, lead back to practices of redlining, you know, that we, we thought we had ruled out in a long time. But how, how is that possible? Well, again, think about AI is nothing else than looking at patterns in data, right? If you find a pattern in data that somebody from a certain class of the population, from a certain, certain socioeconomic backgrounds, historically has been more likely to have a claim, right? The algorithm will pick up on that. And by picking up on that, right, it might build that into the rating algorithm, right? And uh, as a consequence, right, these, um, these patterns will be reinforced, right? And an important aspect there is that um, these algorithms cannot distinguish of whether something is just a mere correlation or whether something is causal, right? Causal here means that if I change something, that it will have a direct impact, right? So think about credit scores. Now think about my credit score. If I forget to take to, to pay a bill tomorrow, right? If I forget to take a pay a bill tomorrow, that may have an impact on my credit score. And we know that credit scores are correlated with driving. How are me forgetting to pay a bill, which will impact credit score, is very likely not going to impact my driving, right? So even though there's this historical correlation in data, right, there's no causal effect that directly links credit score um, to, um, um, that directly links credit score to, to um, um, the probability of getting into an exit. Now, these are very complicated issues, right, because, again, there is a historical correlation. So if there is an historical correlation, maybe that is something you should use in your pricing algorithm. On the other hand, if it's not causal, is it fair to use it? And it's very hard to, to sort through this. And in fact, um, this is one of the areas where science has not 
caught up with, with the real world yet, in that there are no clear approaches on how to sort through these issues. So a couple of key takeaways and, and questions that that um, that should that you should sort of keep in mind, right? So what I try to get across is that these artificial intelligence, or rather machine learning as we've learned, models require data and predict using existing historical patterns, right? So all they're doing is mining patterns in historical data in order to make well-founded predictions. What has changed, however, is that there's much more data available. Think about the Internet of Things, the connectivity in this world. There's more computing power, right? So the prediction approaches now can be much more powerful than they were a couple of decades ago. Better predictions can yield increased efficiency, right? By having better prediction models, right, we're able to automate certain tasks that were historically done by humans, right, which you know, might might lead to cost savings um, um, and might also be able to to redirect um, the human talent into um, more value creating tasks. Right. You might be able to more accurately predict claims, more accurately predict risk. But there's also some dangers and downsides associ associated with these um, the use of these more advanced models. Right. And so the two guidelines that I that I want to leave you with here is to be on the one hand, be skeptical. Right. I think there are players out, out there. Again, I'm referencing this AI snake, ball, um, snake oil point. Right. That try to take advantage of the black box character of these models. Right. If something sounds to be uh, if something sounds to be uh, sounds to be if something sounds to be too good to be true, it might be too good to be true. The second thing is be very, right? Models can have unintended consequences, right? And um, as somebody who checks the operations of insurance companies, one question that in, in my mind is very relevant is who in the company, who in the enterprise checks these unintended consequences? Who's responsible for checking on that and how? Right. And that sort of um, relates to the own risk and solvency assessment, ORSA, right? Who in the enterprise really worries about this risk? Thank you very much. So as we've all heard from Professor Bauer, artificial intelligence and machine learning are here to stay and offer a lot of promise for the insurance industry and consumers. The NEIC, which is, of course, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, started looking at this seven or eight years ago by forming the Big Data Working Group. This group explored a lot of different issues um, as far as what insurers were doing in this space, um, you know, who, what, what algorithms were being used, how they were being used, uh, all sorts of uh, presentations from companies and from vendors. But initially the group really focused on exploring the insurer's use of big data in algorithms on rating in property and casualty insurance. So uh, the, the insurance department were presented with complicated algorithms that were being used in every state by national carriers. However, each of us were attempting to individually review those algorithms. Uh, they are nowhere near uh, as uh, easy is probably the wrong word, but they are more complicated than the average actuary. The average rating actuary uh, is does not uh, know how to dive completely into these algorithms. So we were experiencing a shortage of qualified people to look at the algorithms because we had so many people individually looking at them. Uh, what we did through the NAIC, and again, there's a lot of sometimes misunderstanding of what the NAIC is. The NAIC is just an organization through which the 56 state jurisdictions that regulate insurance coordinate our efforts. Um, in order to reduce the resources necessary and bring some consistency to this process, the uh, Big Data Working Group set up a process through the NAIC to allow the states to collaborate. The NAIC also hired some resources that we could go to. So uh, it, it, looking at um, experts, data scientists, and actuaries in these fields that we could consult. Uh, if our state actuaries 
uh, didn't have the same amount of experience as, as the actuaries the NAIC had hired. Uh, no state is bound by the decision um, on any particular algorithm. We all have separate jurisdiction, but this is just a way to share information, hopefully come to similar conclusions across state lines uh, on the algorithms in property and casualty uh, rating. So of course, the use of uh, big data is much, much broader than that narrow issue. Um, after a few years of the big data working group, the members of the NEIC acknowledged that you know, innovation and technology was an area of increasing importance to state insurance regulators and to insurers. So they formed the NAIC Innovation and Technology Task Force. Um, that was under the executive committee. And what that means is it's a issue of importance and somewhat of the moment. So uh, for instance, the current EX groups, and we call it EX for executive, are climate and race and insurance. Innovation and technology uh, was considered very important uh, and had a task force level. Under that were the Big Data Working Group, which was the original working group, Speed to Market, and the uh, Artificial Intelligence Principles Working Group. In 2020 uh, and 2021, uh, these working groups uh, delivered a couple of deliverables. First, the AI Principles Working Group released a document of principles that commissioners feel companies should be keeping in mind when using uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, number two, uh, the Big Data Working Group uh, undertook a survey of private passenger auto riders to get a better understanding of how AI and ML is being used by insurers. Um, both of those concluded by the end of last year. Also during last year, there was a discussion of how important all of these issues are to insurance regulation. And in a very unusual move, the NAIC created the H Committee. So for those of you who are not extremely familiar with the NAIC, there's a lot of committees under the NAIC, but there's eight letter committees. That's what we call them. And those are really the permanent committees. It's not that they can't be disbanded, but it's unlikely that they'll be disbanded. So those committees are the A committee is life, B is health, C is property and casualty, D is market regulation, F is financial, I'm sorry, E is financial, F is accreditation, G is international, and the new committee, uh, H, is innovation and cybersecurity. Uh, that shows how important this entire issue is to the various commissioners. Uh, the Big Data Working Group, the original working group on this, still exists and now reports through uh, to the H Committee. And I am still chair of the Big Data Working Group. Not still, actually, I've been vice chair, I've been a couple of different things. Uh, but from those humble beginnings, we have um, spun off four work streams under Big Data that we'd really like to deliver on this year. So those four work streams um, are number one, additional surveys. So as I mentioned, we did surveys of the private passenger automobile uh, market last year. We are still analyzing the responses. We have released anonymized data from those surveys. We will not be releasing anything with regard to specific companies, but we will be releasing public information on overall use and what the survey showed. We have, uh, we are continuing our analysis of that while moving on to homeowners and life insurance. So uh, we have a committee of subject matter experts on each area that goes through the survey very, very carefully before we release it. We also um, go to a couple of participants in the market, insurers in the market, and uh, make sure that they understand the survey. Because what, what, what our intent is to get information from insurers on how they're using uh, AI and ML, and we want to make sure they understand the questions before we do that. So we're hopeful that the homeowner survey, uh, I was saying would be out this month, I now think it's going to be July, um, and the life a couple months later. Again, we will have high level information probably by the end of 2021, uh, but it does take a long time to analyze this data. So I'm sure we'll be continuing to do that into 2022. And we'll also be discussing whether um, other areas 
uh, should be surveyed. Of course, this is, we realize, a moment in time. So we realize that insurers are constantly looking at <laughs> AI and ML in different ways uh, to approach different issues. Uh, but we're just trying to get our hands around uh, that moment in time and actual use as opposed to, <coughs> excuse me, anecdotal information we have on what insurers are doing. So the second work stream, oh, and by the way, that work stream is being run by Kevin Gaffney in Vermont. Uh, the second work stream is our regulatory approach to third-party data and model vendors, and that's being run by Doug Oman of Iowa. Uh, Doug has been chair or vice chair of the Big Data Working Group for many, many years and is deeply involved in this area. And uh, what, he, he, what his group is looking at is um, the, mo the vendors that are <clears throat> selling the data, if that's the right word, uh, to insurers. So uh, there are a number of vendors who have chosen to apply for advisory organization licenses from the Departments of Insurance. There are other vendors that have chosen not to do that. Uh, the insurer is, of course, responsible for the data they're using. But the real question here is, is there a role for the insurance regulators to separately look at the vendors that are selling this information to the insurance industry? Um, so that's a pretty big thing to bite off. There's a lot of questions there. And, and Doug's group will be putting together really kind of a list of questions and probably some suggestions. Um, the third work stream is being run by Adrian Harris of New York, and it is what an exploration of the tools and resources uh, that a regulator should be using or could be using to monitor the insurer's use of big data and AI and ML. So <clears throat> this will explore some of the things that uh, some consumer groups have been saying, that uh, they believe that the use of AI and ML might result in unfair discrimination. Of course, that is not correct. The statutes all uh, provide that uh, insurance rates are not to be unfairly discriminatory. Um, so th the question is, how do we determine that? And what tools are being used by insurers uh, to, d to make sure that's not happening, uh, which is, of course, is in the insurer's best interest as well. And the final work stream is implementation of the artificial intelligence principles, which were released by the Innovation and Technology Task Force a year ago. And that's being run by Amy Beard of Indiana. Uh, when those were released, they uh, were just a, a document that says, here's our principles. Um, in the way the NAC normally works, um, we, we have things like that, white papers and statements, but we also have regulations, model regulations, model bulletins, model uh, laws that states are free to adopt. So uh, Commissioner Beard's work stream will be looking at whether uh, we should be going down any of those roads uh, in the regulation of big data. So what will the future bring? Um, our goal is to set up a regulatory framework to assure that data is being used appropriately while not hindering industry's use of uh, big data in ways that are beneficial to consumers. I, I think uh, we all agree this is a game changer for the insurance industry. It can bring a lot of efficiencies, but we, our role is to make sure that um, harm does not occur as well. And uh, so we're really struggling with getting to that point. So we are assured uh, that the right controls are in place to make sure that big data is not uh, being used for an improper purpose or having an improper effect. Um, and uh, how do we do that? So that's what the work streams are really doing. This is not a one-year project, although we expect deliverables from each work stream this year. It is certainly not something we're going to solve. This is constantly evolving. Uh, one of the things I bring up is when the, the Data Security Model Act was created, um, I think it was 2016, uh, we actually disbanded the Cybersecurity Working Group, thinking that that work was done. Uh, I mean, the work on cybersecurity is not a done item. It's it's going to continue for uh, as as long as any of us can, can consider. So uh, that has actually been reconstituted under the H Committee. Um, but, uh, you know, we need to be diligent in making sure that insurers understand the data, 
both for its effect on their customers and for its effect on the insurer's operations. So one of our main uh, purposes is to uh, assess the solvency of insurers. If insurers are using big data in critical areas and not understanding it, that certainly can affect uh, the solvency of the insurer. So I anticipate that some of this will bleed into uh, the financial analysis and financial exam process that we currently do on, on a domestic deference basis. Um, so it's a whole new world with potentially very beneficial effects on this industry, but the insurance fundamentals remain extremely important. Um, the regulator's role is to make sure that the use of big, big data is not having a detrimental effect on customers or adversely affecting the solvency of the insurer. And that's what we are uh, working towards. So I think education is going to be key as well, both for staff of insurers to understand the effect and for regulators to understand what the insurers are doing with big data. Um, there will be a public call of the big data working group, I hope in July. It hasn't been scheduled yet, but we're looking at sometime in July. So if you're interested, I would check the NAIC website, which is NAIC.org. There's a, a tab for committees. This would be under the H committee, as it just explained, Big Data Working Group. So thank you for inviting me here today. Um, I look forward to working with all of you as we explore this new world of big data. Thank you. The Institute's Griffith Insurance Education Foundation, the Insurance Regulator Education Foundation, and the Katie School of Insurance at Illinois State University were pleased to collaborate on this session. We thank Dr. Danny Bauer of the Wisconsin School of Business at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and Elizabeth Kelleher Dwyer, Superintendent of Financial Services with the State of Rhode Island for serving as presenters. To learn more about the Griffith Foundation program offerings, we invite you to visit www.griffithfoundation.org.